Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see all those out here this morning. And we continue our study in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it is my task this morning to cover some verses in chapter 19 through to chapter 20. Now, those two chapters are enormous in itself, and we will not be able to go verse by verse or, or even expand upon it in a, in a great way, but just to read it so that each and every one of us can understand future events and that indeed we can go home and read it some more and some more and some more. So shall we pick up the reading in Revelation chapter number 19 and we'll read verse number 11. <clears throat> When you start reading these portions of scripture, you just want to keep reading. And then you want to go to the references and you want to read that as well. And perhaps that's the better way to do it. Nevertheless, chapter 19, verse 11. And John writes and he says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and his head were many crowns diamonds and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of kings and Lord of lords, names most awful, names most high. Verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that he may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, and the kings of the earth, and the armies gather gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and bound him a thousand years. 
and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little while. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them. And the judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog, hey Gog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And when and they went up uh, on the breadth of the earth, compass the earth of the saints above, loved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead, uh, which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the Lord will bless the reading. We would like to read some other portions of scripture too. But I'm not sure about you, but this is very, very grim reading, isn't it? And at the very outset of the meeting, I want to say to you, make sure, make sure you are not found at the great white throne. Because if you appear before the great white throne, it means that you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not saved. And these verses, and the, especially the last verse which we read this morning, is perhaps one of the most solemn verses you'll read in the word of God. And they, that were not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire. Now, those are not my words. We've read it from the word of God this morning. Now, as I mentioned, it's not possible just to speak on these verses with the 20 minutes that we have this morning, except to just get your, get your interest speak. We have before us, over these chapters, three different topics, 
And I'm going to suggest this morning that first of all, we've read about that last and great battle at Armageddon. Then we have read somewhat about the millennial kingdom. We read over and over about Christ who is going to reign for a thousand years. And then in this chapter, we read somewhat of the great white throne. And to add to that, just a link, and that's our brother's message next week, Brother Russell, you have the eternal city or the eternal state. But this morning, I'd like to think very, very quickly um, with your permission about this great last battle and, and and like to think a little bit about as we read here this this great white throne and 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 which comes at the end of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to think of first of all the consummation of the prophetic program. You know, we've been discussing over these many weeks as our brethren have given us and shared with us from the word of God about the revelation of Jesus Christ, we've, we've been thinking about this prophetic program of God. A program that was outlined there in the book of Daniel as he was given that prophecy of, of, of the things that were to happen. And this is all part of God's prophetic program. Now, before I go on, two weeks ago, someone came to me and says, man, I'm enjoying it, but I just can't put together all the different pieces. And so I'm going to ask David to put up a little chart for us. And so we can see, because we've come to the very end of the tribulation period. All right? We read a few weeks ago about the seventh trumpet. Sorry, the seven bowl. All right? the judgment, and which brought us right to the very end of the tribulation period. And uh, that is all part of God's prophetic program. And so after all these weeks of study, we've come to the, the consummation, the ending of God's prophetic program. Before we look at that, I'd like to think secondly of the crisis of earth which takes place at this geographic place on earth. That's going to speak about that battle at Armageddon. And then we want to think of the culmination of satanic power. We read here that, that, that Satan was cast into the lake of fire. All right, that's the culmination. You know, you and I, we've been, we've been living our lives and we've been reading much of all that the evil one has done. How again he tempted our, our first parents in the Garden of Eden and how it is his purpose to be against God. But his reign is coming to an end. His influence is coming to an end. So we read in this portion not only uh, brethren and sisters of the consummation of, pro of, of prophetic, uh, the prophetic program and the crisis on earth which takes place at, at Armageddon, but it's a culmination of satanic power. And then finally, we want to think of the coming of a sovereign king, a sovereign person. We sang much of it this morning about the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. And so we want to think a little bit about the, the ending or the consummation of prophetic, the prophetic program of God. Brethren and sisters, you know, we're living in a world and we're too scared to put on the television, isn't it? We're too scared to read the newspaper because of wars and uh, rumors of wars and, and, and suffering and death. And we wonder in ourselves, what, what next? If you look at the world today, economically, it's in a disastrous place, isn't it? Socially, in a terrible place. Politically, it's in a terrible place. Disaster, right? And these are all signs 
which tell us that we are living in the end times. I trust you and I grasp that, that you and I might be living in a time just before the rapture. All right, the Lord might come before the meeting's over. All right, and so in response to the question two weeks ago, I can't put it together. And the fact that this portion and my first point is really the consummation of, of prophetic, the prophetic program, we want to think very, very quickly of how do we put this all together. Now, we've been hearing much about, about this period here um, from here through the which is going to speak about Daniel's 70 week prophecy that he was given. And we, we worked it out, and our brother Felix very kindly uh, worked out all those calculations. And, and, and we are, are, the time the Lord Jesus Christ died, we are living now in this period here, the church age. The word of God calls it the dispensation of the grace of God. And we are living, in my opinion, just somewhere here before the church is raptured. So Daniel, 70 weeks, years, starts here with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, the walls and so forth. And we began all along. And you read about the prophecy, and all that happened, and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ Messiah, and how he was cut off. And then, between the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture, the prophetic clock has stopped. 69th week, awaiting the rapture of the church. And so this is where we find ourselves, the rapture. And let me say, brethren and sisters, that there is nothing more. There's no more to be done. There's nothing holding Christ back from coming to rapture the church. I trust you and I, are, we recognize that that could happen today. Now, I ask you, before we go on, are you ready? Are you ready? You see, the Bible says that the Lord himself shall come from heaven. He'll come himself, brethren and sisters, and it says there, the dead in Christ shall rise first. You'll notice the little term, the dead in Christ. That means those who have died who were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to rise first. Then it says, we which are alive and remain, those who are, are, are loving you and I today as believers, we're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Right? Now, the second coming of the Lord has got two stages. Number one, the Bible says he's going to come to the air. That's to receive the church. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You can read those verses in the word of God about the fact that he's come to the air. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 and 17. You go home and read it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and so forth in the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the first stage of his second coming, you'll come to the end. To receive his church. That's the rapture right there. Right? Then we have this tribulation period, which our brethren have been speaking about over this last few months. <coughs> and uh, we have that period split up into three and a half years. And then the last three and a half years. And we know that in this tribulation periods, there are three sets of judgments. We covered it before. We have the seal judgments. And we have the trumpet judgments. And we read a few weeks ago about the bowl judgments. And we found those judgments were more severe. Until we came to the bowl judgments. And those verses we, which we read two or three weeks ago, they were very hard to read. We read there about the sea, every living creature in the sea, dead, blood, the springs, blood, and, and so forth, and, and the sun, 
the scorching of the sun, the burning of the cities. And we read there about those hailstones, judgment of God. And as we read through all those judgments, with sadness, despite men knowing that this was the judgment of God, we read over and over. They blasphemed against God. They rejected God. They would not repent. And so we've come to the very end of this tribulation period. So we have Daniel's 70 weeks, and that 70 weeks stopped here of week 69, and we have the prophetic clock stop, and then there's going to be the rapture. After that, this period of tribulation will, will stop. We're not told if there's a gap between the rapture and the tribulation period. Uh, some say it's very quick. We're not told, but that tribulation period will start with the signing of a, 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 a peace treaty, right? We read that in our in, in those first judgments, isn't it? Uh, and so that period will be a period of judgment upon men upon this earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm very glad I'm saved. Because the church who are believers who are, belong to Christ will be raptured and will not go through the tribulation period. All right? Be thankful for that. All right. Now we've come right to the end. In this part here, you'll see it says the second coming. That's the second phase of his coming. You see, this was he come, but he came to the end. But here the Lord Jesus Christ will come right to this earth at a crucial stage and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. Brethren and sisters, the Lord said, if I go, I will come again. You know, it was prophesied that he would come the first time. Born in Bethlehem's manger. And he came at the right time to the very day. Right. And he said he'd come again. And God is faithful. And God is true. And so he will come. And so that will cover our first point, the consummation of, of his prophetic program. The thought that I, I was thinking about as I, as I considered this is that God's purposes will not be thwarted. I know it's one of my favorite lines. Because really it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. We see wars. We see evil on every hand. Brethren and sisters, God's program is in <coughs> motion, right? And as believers, we trust in him. He knows the end from the beginning. But of course, we tend to read about a crisis upon this earth at this period, towards the end of the tribulation period where Christ is going to come. Now I want you to turn back to chapter 16, please, because it's good to read it and just to understand what we are talking about. And if, if, if we just read these verses and understand them, well, that will be good enough, right? And so as we go back to chapter 16, we remember we spoke about the parenthesis and how that, uh, the book of Revelation jumps around and there are certain gaps explaining what's going to happen upon earth. And verse 12 of chapter 16 of Revelation, verse 12 is going to explain to us about this crisis upon earth. It says there, and the sixth angel poured out his vial or his bowl upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. You see, man and the beast and governments and kings were making their own plans, but God was in control. He was going to dry up the river, so that the, the armies of the east could march to the Middle East, so that all the nations, all the armies, both from the east and from the west, would be sent to day, awaiting as it were for God's judgment. All right? And it says in verse 10, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, yes, the Antichrist, and the mouth of the and out of the mouth of the false prophet. 
for they are the spirits of demons working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, I know this day is referred to as Armageddon. But really speaking, the word of God calls it that great day of God Almighty. All right? So here's the crisis. And it says in verse 16, and he gathered them. This is Satan. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So right, God is in control. He's dried up the rivers. Yes, the armies of the West and the East, they are all fighting amongst each other and all fighting there in the Middle East. Mind you, we see that happening today, don't we? All centered in the Middle East. Armies from all over, centered in the Middle East. Their desire, as far as the kings is concerned, is to fight one another. But ultimately, the truth is going to come out. Ultimately, the truth will come out. You'll find that they all fight against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so here's the crisis coming. The crisis of earth which takes place in a geographical place. This, yes, is there in the Middle East. And of course, you can go read other portions of scripture. And uh, we don't have the time to read all of them. But it's good to know what is going to happen. And so, chapter 16, we've read verse 12 to 16. But the armies which have been assembled. And of course, this was all part of God's program. Very, very quickly, turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And as I mentioned, it's best to read this. Because... What I've got to say might be crazy, but the word of God speaks for itself. Zechariah chapter 14. You see, God is the one who is in control. And here will be a crisis. A crisis in Jerusalem. Right? A crisis in Jerusalem. A crisis in the Middle East. All the armies assembled, fighting with one another. That's their desire. And it says here... In verse 1 of chapter 14, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city, this is Jerusalem, shall be taken. That's the crisis. Jerusalem will be taken. And the houses, rifle. And the woman ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then, at this time of crisis, at this time when all the armies are gathered together there in the Middle East, around Jerusalem, in, in that area, it says in verse 4, verse 3, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, take your time at home and go and read through the rest of the chapter because that indeed is helpful. And so, chapter 19, which we read, verse number 19, gives us the true enemy, right? It says in verse 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies. Remember, they came to fight with each other. They came to destroy Jerusalem. But here we see who the true enemy was as far as they were concerned. They were anti-God, it says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Can you picture it? They're fighting with each other. They've overrun Jerusalem. The east, the west, the, from the north. And all of a sudden, Christ comes on his horse with his armies. And the enemies on earth become, they, they join together and they fight against God. 
Of course, who can fight against God? <laughs> we can't fight against God, yes. Uh, that culmination or this crisis that's on earth at the end of the consummation of God's prophetic program, we find the real reality of the truth. That man, that the devil has deceived the king and still deceives the hearts of men that they should turn away from God, that they should reject the Christ of God. Brothers and sisters, it is Satan who is the enemy. Now, yes, this is a crisis. But of course we read here that who can fight God? Who can fight the king of kings? All right? We read here some of the culmination of satanic power. Chapter 20, verse number 1 to 3. Now, we read those verses. And it's amazing. Now, there are other chapters you can read. But this is on our portion. It says here, here's the culmination of satanic power. It says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. You know, brethren and sisters, we love to quote that little phrase, greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world. And here we find his very culmination. We find his ending. Yes, he's, he's tied here for a thousand years. He's going to be released as we as we found, but that's 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 very short lived. All right. We read there about his ending, his cost into the lake of fire into the lake of fire chapter verse 10 it says there and the devil uh, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire uh, he's got some friends there he's got some friends there it says not only him it says we're the beast we've been reading much about the beast over these many months isn't it not only the beast but the false prophet it says, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Now that's that's a mockly trio, isn't it? And yet when we read further, we read about men. Woman, small and great, they too were cast into the world. But of course, we love to think about the coming of the Son. Yes, there's the consummation of God's prophetic program. God's in control. And that's a very, that's very hard. I won't say hard moment. Calming to the soul. And we want to read something about that. As we did. Here's the coming of the sovereign. And uh, we don't have the time, but look at this, this, this threefold title of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 19 of uh, uh, verse 11 of chapter 19, he is the faithful and true. Isn't that lovely, brother and sister? That the God whom we serve, he is a faithful God. He is the faithful and true. That's going to speak somewhat, don't we think, of his dignity. And you and I, we can depend on the faithfulness of God in our lives. All right? You know your life as I do mine. You know the difficulties. You know the problems. You know the challenges. I want to remind you. That the God whom we serve, he is faithful. Right? He's faithful. Not only is he faithful, it says he is faithful and true. All right? We can count on such a God. Of course, we have our responsibility on our side that we are faithful to him. 
It is required in a steward that he be found faithful. So we live our Christian lives, trusting in God, the one who is faithful and true. That is dignity. Then it says here in this verse, it's in verse 13, it says that not only is he, he has the title of being faithful and true, but he is, has the title of the word of God. Isn't that wonderful? The logos, the word of God. John likes to speak about that, doesn't he? He says, man, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, he is the faithful and true witness. But more than that, he is the word of God. You know, today, you've got to be very careful what you read because you don't know if it's true, isn't it? But here, the Lord Jesus Christ he is the Logos. He is the very word of God. And you and I can trust in that. His dignity, faithful and true. His deity, he is the word of God. But then we read in verse 16 that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yes, this is his sovereignty. Oh, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, they rejected him, isn't it? They said, away with him, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And we remember our Pilate wrote there upon, upon him, gave him a title. King of the Jews. And they objected to that. They said, don't, don't, don't write that he's the king of the Jews. Write there that he said he's the king of the Jews. The one who has the final say. The one who's going to come with power and glory and, and, and is able to put down all authority. Riding upon a white horse. He is king of kings. And he is lord of lords. King of my life. Is he king of your life? You bow down in his presence? Do you submit to his word? Is he lord of your life? And I cannot say this very time. If he's not lord of your life in time, as far as you are concerned, it's not Lord at all. King of kings and Lord of kings. His dignity, his deity, and his sovereignty. Three titles, a threefold title given to this one who is going to come and put down all power. You know, they say that at this, uh, the armies just from the east, the Bible says they, they, they were 200 million men assembled there at Armageddon. And that doesn't even account for the other armies. That's just the east. And yet when he comes, we don't read in these verses, and we will read a little bit more. They just destroy it. Right. Just destroy it. King of kings and lords. Now there's a threefold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he's got a threefold title, but we also need a threefold description, and, and, and we don't have the time to expand upon it. But it says there in verse 12, I think it is, his eyes as a flame of fire. Now we've had this term before, isn't it? He sees through all. Right? A flame of fire. He knows your life. You can try to catch me. Or you can try to catch your mother or your father. Or you can try to catch your husband. Doesn't matter. He has eyes as a flame of fire. Then it says in verse 12 of chapter 19, on his head were many crowns or many diamonds. Isn't that lovely? Uh, a brother, I think it was a brother, David this morning in his prayer, he spoke about the crown of thorns which they gave. Whether this is the one who is going to come to put down all authority, to reclaim this earth. He has the title deeds for this earth. He's crowned with diadem. Isn't that wonderful? Man. Gave him a crown of thorns. 
but he's got a crown of life. It says there in verse 12 that he had a name written that no man knew. A threefold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I can't, it's, it's off course. Threefold title, a threefold description. Now, what does he do? Verse 11, he is the righteous judge who makes war. You know, the first time the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came and was born in Bethlehem's village. In humility, he came as a servant in obedience to his father and laid down his life at the cross of Calvary. But at his second coming, he's coming to judge this world, to make war. It says there that he, he, he's, he's, he's coming to make war. He's righteous. You know, today people go to war unjustly, unrighteously, isn't it? False claims. But when he comes, to make war is the righteous one. Then it says very, very quickly, because our time is up, he says his clothes, excuse me, with a vesture of blood. The blood of his enemies. You know, when he first came, he laid down his life. His blood was shed. But man rejected it. And here, as he judged this world, it says that he is clothed with a vesture of then, in verse 14, he comes with power and might. Armies come with him. He's coming with power. And out of his mouth, a sharp sword, sword. And he's going to reign. It says here he's going to rule with a rod of iron. I don't know about you. I'm very glad I'm saved. Now, you know, we see the signs of our times. We see the signs, don't we, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in his first stage, which is the rapture. And we look around about us and we see what's happening in this world and, and we, we get perplexed, don't we? And we worry and we get fearful because we're human. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he knew. And as he spoke to those, he is going to tell them about this time. I wonder if I can just read those verses for you. Luke chapter 21. Just that you and I might be encouraged as we see the signs, the things that's happening in this world. Luke chapter 21, verse 25. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. And with us, look. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity. We see that today, don't we? And it says the sea and the waves roaring. It says in verse 20, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. Now the Lord is speaking about this time, isn't it? In the tribulation period. Now he says, now listen, as he speaks about these signs, he says in verse 28, thus he's speaking to those of his own. He says, now when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. Draweth nigh. Isn't that all moving, brethren and sisters? That you and I, yes, we see the signs and the distresses and the injustice or injustice of this world, the cruelty. We see the 
arrogance of men, of kings, of rulers. But brethren and sisters, God is in control. Jesus shall reign. He is the one who will come and rule and rail with the Lord of He will put down all power. And I want to tell you a little secret. Did you know that we're going to reign with him? The church will come and reign with him for a thousand years. And indeed, that will be unlike the reign in that period of the tribulation period. Why? The one who reigns, he reigns with righteousness and justice, a faithful God, a true God, and we say with a humanity. Jesus shall reign. We rear the sun. Not his successive journeys around. Brothers and sisters. So, the living God who will reign and nothing is able to stop. May the Lord encourage us. Sorry for getting